We like knowing who we are. Don't you? I like knowing who I am. I come from, my family comes from, a little spot up in Walker County called Jasper. And even more specific, there's a beautiful little place called Nauvoo. Nauvoo is just a little bitty old, you go down some road that's not even marked and you turn right and all of a sudden you're in Nauvoo. Nauvoo is a nice place. I've got friends and relatives who live up there. I was talking to a little girl at work the other day. Where are you from? We start talking. I'm from Walker County. I'm from Walker County. Start talking a little bit further on. Yeah, we live out there by Red Mill School. My parents went to Red Mill School up in Walker County. Yeah, but they live a little bit further down the road in an old place called Nauvoo. My, my great-grandmother lived in Nauvoo all her life. We keep talking, and of course, we end up being something like third or fourth cousin. Someplace back in the line, we got relatives. We got relatives. You know, one of the biggest businesses you can find online today is Ancestry.com. You can go to Ancestry.com, and you can pay the money. If you pay the money, they'll be happy to help you search your your family tree all the way back to no telling how far. When David was in the seventh grade, he wanted to do it. So we got online and we looked. We got the Crawfords all the way back to North Carolina where they were farmers. We got Kathy's family all the way back to, I think, nearly the 1600s in England, which is wonderful stuff. It's nice to know where we come from. We like looking back to our forefathers. We like looking back to our roots Remember when Roots was big? When Roots came out? I remember when I was a kid, we watched Roots. Why? Because knowing who we are and where we come from is very important to us. We like having the the, the foundation of what we are as much as who we are socially, culturally, economically. We, we, all these things fit together and help us understand who we are. We said... What is it that we say about history? Those who don't know their own history are doomed to repeat it. Those that don't know where they're coming from can't tell where they're going. Now with that in mind, I want you to turn in your Bible to Ephesians. If you turn over to Ephesians 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 14 and go through... uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, starting in uh, verse 11, going through verse 13. Verse 11. Paul's talking to the Ephesians, and he says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise that have no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let that sink in for just a second. Brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul is trying to help them remember. You came from somewhere. You are going to somewhere. And the catalyst, the thing in the middle that made the change is the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. When you look there, he tells them, you know, you have come from death to life. From death to life. In Romans 5, 12, and then skipping down to verse 17, it says this, Therefore, just as though... just As through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Then you drop down to verse 17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, how much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He told us, remember, one man, back in the beginning, Adam, and I know people debate about who, who, where's the sin? You know, Adam was responsible. He knew what he was doing. He stepped up to the plate, he picked up the bat, and he hit the ball. Adam was there. Takes two to tango. Paul says, it's by that one man that sin entered the world. But it's by one man, Jesus, that sin has been taken out of the world. 
And we need that one man, Jesus, because in Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where is eternal life found? It's in Christ. Paul is telling them, you were dead in your sins. He says at that time, and back in Ephesians uh, 2.12, he says, at that time you were without Christ. And we know life is found in Christ. In Christ. That's where life is found. He's saying you were dead. You were done. There was no hope. You can just see him saying, no, I'm fine. I'm walking around. I'm having a great time. Look at me. He says, no, you're dead in your sins. It's your sins that will condemn you. Your sins. And he says, it's in Christ where we have remission of those sins. In Ephesians 2, 1, if you back up just a little bit, Paul says, and you, he made alive who were dead in the trespasses and sin. And it is you, he made alive. Christ made alive because of the sacrifice he made because of the blood that he shed we have been brought near by his blood for salvation that's what we've been brought near for for salvation where's salvation it's in Christ by the blood of Christ over and over again we hear that in the scripture by the blood of Christ we have been brought near. We've been taken from death to life to salvation. Not only that, we have been brought near. We have become from being enemies of God to being as children of God. He says, having no hope, um, in verse 12, back in verse 12, Ephesians 2.12, the second part of that is being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. You know the covenants of promise came through Moses. The whole Old Testament is about the covenant of promise. And Moses made that promise, carried that promise down from the mountain for us. At one time, when God is talking to Abraham, he says, I'm going to cut a covenant with you. And in those days, when they talked about cutting a covenant, they'd take an animal and they'd split it down the middle and they'd put the two sides off the side. And when two people had a covenant between them, they would take that animal, put it on either side, and then they'd walk through the middle to signify we have a, we have a covenant between us. A covenant between us that means something. Paul is reminding them that they weren't part of that covenant. They're Gentiles. We're Gentiles. We did not have a part of that covenant. And he's trying to help them understand that you've been taken from being nobody, Gentiles, outcast, the trash of the world. Now you're children of God. You're the children of God. Romans 5.10 it says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? It was not only his death, that was part that, that helps us. It's also the fact that he's arisen and it's his life that is part of us now. Helps us to become children of God. Christ, our brother, is the first fruits of that resurrection. And we look to that for, for our assurance. In 1 John 3, 1 it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Listen to it one more time. Behold! What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. How beautiful is that? That we should be called children of God. I do not ever want to give that up. I look back and, and people say, well, who are you? Well, I'm Scott. And they say, well, no, who are you? I can run into people that are in church because I've grown up in the church. And they'll say, well, who are you? I'm Scott. They say, but no. I say, oh, you might know my dad. Thurman Crawford. He's a butcher. Oh, Thurman. Oh, him we know. Oh, you're little Scott. Yeah, well, not little anymore, right? Grown a little bit, put on a little weight. 
not little anymore. That's okay. But I identify, they identify me by my father, by my mother, by my family. That's who we are. We're identified by God. We're identified by our older brother who arose from the grave. We're identified by our family right here. Our family that sits with us and helps us and helps us understand who we are, that we draw strength from every week. We like being somebody's children. Like it. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, and we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. For indeed, we suffer with Him that we may also be glorified together. We were adopted, brought near by the blood of Christ for salvation. God took us into His family so that we no longer had to be afraid to approach God. In the Old Testament, they were afraid to even put their foot on the mountain that God stood upon. They were afraid to even come near it. They said, no, we don't. Moses, you go for us. Because we don't want it. It's scary. Scary's bad. We don't want it. We, on the other hand, have been brought near. We can approach the throne of God with with a with assurance with a strong will we can approach the throne of God we can go up to the throne of God and, and, and not be afraid in fact we can say Father Father here I am your child we have been grafted in remember at one point he talks about the olive trees We've, we're like that wild olive tree that has been grafted in now we're part of the olive tree we're the children of God. Not only has the blood of Christ been brought us near for salvation, but the blood of Christ has also brought us close so we might have a relationship. A relationship with God that you can't get outside of the blood of Christ. Only by the blood of Christ can you have that relationship. God wants us to have a relationship. How many people are mentioned in John 3.16? Some, a few, a bit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, that is a great big word. Great big word. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that should all should come to a knowledge of him. That's us. He wants us in that relationship with him. Not only has the blood of Christ brought us near for salvation. Not only has the blood of Christ brought us near for a relationship. But we've also, from the blood of Christ, have been brought from having no identity to being the people of God. If you go back into Ephesians and you look back at verse 12 again, it says, having no hope and without God in the world. No hope and without God. That's how they were. They were with no hope without God. That's how we are before we become Christians. We are no hope without God. There is no hope without God. Nowhere you can go without God. And be safe can't be done. Galatians 3, 26-28 says this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. When you don't have an identity, when you don't know who you are, you're lost. You're lost without a hope. You're lost without an anchor. Those, those, those farmers that were in North Carolina that my family goes all the way back to. I've never been to North Carolina. But I know I've got an anchor in North Carolina. 
I can come all the way down to Walker County. And I know my family is from Walker County. I can go to the place where my grandparents are buried. And look at their stones. And remember them. And the time we spent together. Having a hope is so crucial to us. Without having a hope in our life, we're just, we're empty shells. When we didn't have an identity, we were brought to an identity in Christ. And Paul says in Galatians, how are we put into Christ? Through baptism. That's how we're put into Christ. In Titus 2, 13 and 14, it says, looking to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's us. We're special people. We have been made special. We have been redeemed to be special. We, God, through our appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us. We want to be redeemed. Christ redeemed us. We want to be special. We have been made special. We're part of the family. Sometimes we sing that song. I'm part of a family. That's been born again. We're part of that family. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We have obtained mercy because we have been called out. Called out. And that's exactly what church means. Those that have been called out. We've been called out of the world into something special, into that relationship. We have been called out of our sin into a life of sinlessness and purity and holiness. We've been called out of the darkness into light because of the working of God and Jesus Christ. It's that blood of Christ that has brought us near and made us a community. Made us a community. You know, we've seen uh, several things now that have brought us near by the blood of Christ, right? We saw that the blood of Christ brought, brings us, by the blood of Christ, we have our salvation. By the blood of Christ, we have a relationship. We're called the children of God. Not just the friends of God, not the slaves of God, not the workers of God, even though we might be all those things. But we are the children of God. We've also been, by the blood of Christ, we have a new beginning. That it's in Christ we have our salvation. We have our community. We have our hope. All these things are brought about by the blood of Christ. Now remember, once you were Gentiles, now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. On one side you were lost, away, gone, outside. Blood of Christ, inside, found. Rejoiced over. All these things keep coming back over and over again because it is the blood of Christ that is the crux of our life. The crux of our life. We look to Jesus as the greatest apostle that was ever sent by God. He's the Son of God. Jesus Christ said, Before Abraham was, I am. I am. Now listen to, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Do you remember that? The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. Jesus said, if you build your house, if you listen to his words, you're like the man who built his house on a rock. Wise. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, He, I am He, you will die in your sins. Believing is essential to being a child of God. Without faith, 
cannot please God. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance. Jesus said you must turn from your old life to the new life. That's what repenting means. It means turning, a, turning from one way and going another way. Jesus said in, in Matthew 10, 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Confession is something we do. We do it once, yes, but we do it our entire life. During class, we talked about an action that, that we not only do once, but we do our entire life. Seek and you shall find. That's an action that occurs all the time. We all the time seek. I understand we confess before we're baptized. But confession is something that occurs our entire life. We identify with Christ. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He puts belief and baptism together. That one little word, and, it's a conjunction, gives equal weight to both parts of the equation. One plus one equals two every time. 1 plus 0 does not equal 2. Does not equal 2. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You can go through all the motions. You can hear. You can believe. You can repent, confess, be baptized. But if you don't live as a Christian... All those things have accumulated in nothing more than getting wet. Nothing more than getting wet. We are the children of God. And we are to live as the children of God. We are a community devoted to God. And we're to live as that community. We have salvation in the blood of Christ. We ought to live like we have that salvation. You know... It's like there's an old Irish proverb, may those that love us, and those that don't love us, stay away from us. But if they have to come, let them turn their ankles so we can know them by their limping. In other words, those people that don't like us, as long as they're limping, we know. There's another one. It sounds very, uh, very similar to that kind of idea. And it says, may you have the hindsight to know where you have been the foresight to know where you are going, and the insight to know when you have gone too far.